the United States continues on the path of war to China, and China is very well aware, and this war has multiple fronts. On the primary front, which generally get, garners more attention, is military. And that in and of itself has not slowed down. The United States is actually continuing to build up a kinetic war with China, which could explode. It's not getting attention in the mainstream media and in the collective West as it should, but could explode also to a broader confrontation. And I've reported here that now you have U.S. special forces just three kilometers off the coast of mainland China in the islands of uh, Kinmen and Penghu. And these islands are, of course, controlled supposedly by the Taiwan Authority, but it gets even more serious. The latest reports are that they will be permanently based. The U.S. Green, Green Berets will be for the first time in Taiwan, in Penghu and Kinmen, in these bases that were reported not too long before this in January uh, in February of 2023. So the Green Berets are there, and here's the report from Taiwan News. And Taiwan News says the U.S. has reportedly stationed special forces in Taiwan to conduct continuous training missions in the country. So you see that. What country is this? They're saying Taiwan is the country, but Taiwan isn't a country. Taiwan is actually, by international law standards, a part of Chinese territory, all of China, one China, the overall policy framework that guides China-Taiwan relations and ultimately uh, the world's uh, approach to the China and Taiwan question. So already here you have, this is pro-independence media reporting this and saying that we're going to be doing continuous training missions in the country. Why would Green Berets be training? I'm going to get more into this after the report. So following the implementation of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2023 in the United States, American military advisors have begun being permanently stationed in Army amphibious bases in Kinmen and Penghu this year. Uh, they are conducting periodic training exercises and sessions with various Taiwan Special Force units. Since last year, U.S. Special Forces have been assisting Taiwan in learning to operate the Black Hornet Nano, a military micro unmanned aerial vehicle, in helping develop guidelines and instructional materials. The Aviation and Special Forces Command has submitted a proposal to purchase the drone from the U.S. through arms sales channels. The National Defense Authorization Act includes plans for sending officials to Taiwan. Currently, there are no reported plans for civilian officials to be stationed in Taiwan. However, it's reported that the U.S. Military Special Operations Forces Liaison Element is expanding its training program in the island. This involves sending three-person teams from the Army Green Berets, specifically from the 1st Special Forces Group, 2nd Battalion, Alpha Company, to be stationed at bases of Taiwan's 101st Amphibious Reconnaissance Battalion and Airborne Special Service Company for continuous joint training, serving as resident training observers. Contrary to the past, when the U.S. military frequently visited the Army Airborne Training Center, now located in the new site in Pingtung, in the Gongguan Special Forces Training Center, there were no U.S. personnel previously stationed at these locations. So here you have them literally saying this is actually a, uh, a this is actually an escalation. That while there has been, of course, um, prior military engagement in Taiwan. I mean, we have. Uh, example after example of this with the tens of billions of dollars over almost $20 billion backlog that exists between China, uh, I mean, between Taiwan and the United States arms sales. Uh, this is still a, a major escalation. Why? Because now we're talking about permanent forces, permanent forces that did not exist before. Since last year, the SOFLE was stationed at Taiwan Special Operations Command Base in Taiyuan's Longtan District. All U.S. Special Operations personnel in Taiwan are under the guidance, support, and control of the post in Taiyuan, and it manages high-value equipment and training materials temporarily stored in Taiwan. Uh, uh, Su Zhu Yun, Director of the Division of Defense Strategy and Resources at the Institute of National Defense and Security Research, 
was cited as saying the Green Berets are a defensive type of special forces. This is really interesting. Employed to counteract enemy infiltration, especially when integrated with Taiwan's amphibious reconnaissance battalions. They include the 1st Reconnaissance Company in Kinmen, 2nd Reconnaissance Company in Matsu, and 3rd Reconnaissance Company in Penghu, as well as the mouth of the Tamoy River. In an interview with CNN in 2021, Tsai Ing-wen became the first president in 40 years to acknowledge that there are U.S. troops deployed in the country. This latest news about the Green Berets marks the first report of permanently stationed military personnel in Taiwan from the United States. When asked for a comment on the report, the Ministry of National Defense in Taiwan said the content of the NDAA is aiming to assist Taiwan in developing comprehensive ta- training and institutionalized capabilities. Exchanges with foreign militaries will be carried out according to actual plans, and no comments will be made on the details of such activities, said the ministry. Uh, they added that this will continue to make concerted efforts to train and prepare for war to ensure national security and stability. They're admitting it here. They are training and preparing for war. But the Department of Defense, a spokesperson, said, we don't have to comment on, we don't have a comment on special operations, engagements, and training, but I would highlight our support and defense relationship with Taiwan remains aligned against the current threat posed by the People's Republic of China. Our commitment to Taiwan is rock solid and contributes to the maintenance of peace and stability. As you know, the U.S. has a long-standing one-China policy, so they're saying they uh, um, uh, affirm the one-China policy, but they say they lead it with the Taiwan Relations Act, as that's what guides them. And then they talk about the three joint communiques and six assurances, which is interesting because actually the Taiwan Relations Act is in many ways the counteract to the one-China principle. So when the United States normalized with China in the late 1970s, it was a years-long process of not just signing these uh, joint communiques with China, two in the 70s and the one in the early 1980s. It was also about a counteract that allowed the United States, which is what the Taiwan Relations Act does, or at least it sanctions it in domestic policy, for the United States to arm Taiwan despite acknowledging Taiwan as part of a one China. That is the contradiction here that's always existed. And now you see that the United States, the Department of Defense, is leading with the Taiwan Relations Act, which is in and of itself dangerous. But Taiwan authorities, uh, the president, all of them have acknowledged that they are preparing for war with the help of the United States. And the Taiwan Authority, the pro-independence forces that lead it, they are trying to claim that the Special Operations Forces, the Green Berets, are a defensive, a defensive operation. Well. But let's talk about the special forces, the U.S. special forces. They are actually deployed in 70% of the world's countries. Are they are they engaging in defensive operations? Absolutely not. How are they protecting the United States? They are infamous, the U.S. special forces are, of reigning terror during the war on terror in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. The war crimes that have been committed in those countries, a lot of them have been committed by these special forces units. They were instrumental in the dirty wars in Latin America, especially in places like Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, etc. Training Contra forces to destroy, pillage, and plunder and destabilize that region. So we're talking about special forces. These, they have a reputation. They have a reputation in places like the former Yugoslavia, Kosovo, for example, reigning terror on these countries, on the people, on Serbs, etc. We go on and on and on. The examples are everywhere. The U.S. special forces are not a defensive operation. They are an offensive operation meant to provoke war. And China is very well aware of this. And what's interesting to note here is that China has every reason to be prepared for war. China has made many warnings. Wang Yi has just done so in recent comments about the Taiwan question. You'll never hear uh, whether it's China's foreign ministry or any U.S. official or any Chinese official commenting on U.S. relations. They'll always add that warning that Playing with fire with Taiwan will lead you to get burned. And this has already occurred. There have already been consequences 
Okay, this is this has been an ill reported story, uh, but it was only in the last several months that people have died because of the tensions that have flared up on the Taiwan Straits led by these U.S. aggressive maneuvers. Uh, here you had late in February, China-Taiwan frictions flare after deaths of fishermen back and forth between Beijing and Taipei come weeks after a Taiwan election locked in a tense status quo. So after the uh, Democratic Progressive Party, far from Democratic, Democratic and far from progressive, but this pro-independence party won again the Taiwan Authority elections. Uh, there were fishermen that died in the waters of the Taiwan Straits. Why? Because of these provocations that, of course, have been blamed on China. But as you have just seen, it is the United States that is literally going thousands of thousands of miles off of its coast to provoke China. So there are deaths of two Chinese fishermen after a pursuit by Taiwan's Coast Guard that has set off a series of testy maritime encounters between Beijing and Taipei, heightening tensions along the Taiwan Strait, where Western officials and analysts have warned of the potential for armed conflict. Beijing says it is stepping up law enforcement around Kinmin, a Taiwan-controlled archipelago that sits just three miles from the mainland of China and 100 miles from Taiwan's main island. So do you, do you hear what this is saying? That Kinmin, where the U.S., of course, Taiwan supposedly says it has authority through its pro-independence government over Kinmin. But if we look at the one China principle, actually all of this is Chinese territory, regardless of how autonomous these, this government may be allowed to act. It is still an affront to the constitution of China, to international law, to uh, bilateral deals that have been made between the U.S. and China. But still, that's an important point. Kinmin is 100 miles from Taiwan, 100 miles, but just three from the mainland. So how is this defense again? How are the Green Berets going to help defend Taiwan? Well, Actually, what they're doing is they're conducting an offensive posture. Their training missions will be to prepare for war. This has been the point all along, and Chinese fishermen have paid the price. Chinese Coast Guard officials boarded a Taiwanese sightseeing boat near Kinmen, prompting complaints from, China, but from Taiwanese officials. But why would they complain? Well, what happened? It, um, there was an election, and there was uh, uh, these fishermen... Right. So on February 14th, what happened is that the two fishermen off the coast of Kinmen were killed because Taiwan's Coast Guard pursued a Chinese speedboat that entered its so-called waters uh, that are restricted waters for fishing. The Chinese boat capsized as it fled and two of its four crew members died. Taiwan Mainland Affairs Council, which handles relations with Beijing, said a preliminary investigation indicated its Coast Guard officers performed their duties lawfully and without misconduct. China responded with sharp criticism of Taiwan over the deaths of uh, Zhu Feng Lian, a spokeswoman for China's Taiwan Affairs Offices, called, which was called a vicious incident that seriously hurt the feelings of compatriots on both side of, sides of the strait. So China's Coast Guard is going to up its defenses. China's military, its navy is upping its defenses in response to this incident that has been ongoing for the last several months. And the point of this is that, that people died because of this so-called conflict, that there's disputes among waters, not between countries, but between territories, mainland and Taiwan. Why is this happening? Well, it's because of U.S. policy. It is because it is the United States that is dictating policy in Taiwan. We cannot be naive to believe. If we understand that in Ukraine, a so-called sovereign country, mind you, different from the Taiwan Authority, if we understand that the United States, through its arms sales, through its logistical uh, advisors, its personnel, military personnel sent there, through the very fact that it was the United States that established that government through a coup in 2014, if we understand that Ukraine, nothing happens in Ukraine without U.S. decision making. Well, then we understand that nothing happens in the DPP and the Taiwan Authority government led by it without U.S. decision making. And why? Because the United States has used Taiwan as its so-called unsinkable aircraft carrier for many, many, many decades as a way to try to build up a war with China. Now is escalating that to the point where the Taiwan so-called uh, military, its Coast Guard, is taking such aggressive maneuvers against uh, fishermen from the mainland 
These are so-called restricted waters. But if you look at this, these fishermen died off the coast of mainland China, a hundred miles from Taipei, a hundred miles from Taipei. This is how egregious this is. This is how dangerous this is that Chinese people, people on both sides of the street are at risk. They are at risk because of this aggression. And so um, we have another example. Now we have Green Beret forces stationed off the coast of China, um, very close to the coast of China. And, and this is a huge, hugely dangerous maneuver. One that is complemented, of course, by constant and here's the wall street journal because i want to talk about the economic war as well and recently the economic war has been most mainly focused on uh degrading china's uh, growth by attempting to undermine your trust in china as if it's so simple as trusting or not trusting the point is is that the wall street journal in the western mainstream media the united states as a whole their foreign policy establishment are trying to get you to think that everything about China is just one big lie and everything that China says is one big lie. So they can justify permanently stationing military forces off the coast and justify attempting to curb and contain growth. And what's interesting about this is that uh, the growth numbers, right, the China's growth data, they're saying that uh, China grew less than what they claim in 2023, which was 5.2%. And in the description, I'm just going to say they use this rhodium group, which is literally just a, a, a neocon funded think tank, a Wall Street funded think tank that has studied China for years. Supposedly, all they do is say everything coming out of China is a lie. Nothing here. Right. The skepticism is all about prices and differences and how prices have changed in China, deflation, all of that. And what China is claiming is their growth numbers. But in it. You won't find one single word, right? All they talk about is how is everything being financed? If prices are being, our prices are declining, real estate is declining, all of this. How, how is this happening? Well, uh, they're not going to tell you exactly. They're just going to talk about how China's data is subpar, how uh, China is defending their data, and how if you look at what's happening in the world, if you look at the their so-called anomalies between right asset investment they're going to use all these terms and they're going to, they're going to try to economic and legalize you into right use this language to confuse you um essentially though what they're not telling you about is the economic war that's being waged against china there's not one word in this i can't find a word in here about how any kind of problems in China, if there are, which China has basically proven, <laughs> are not major problems. Even if there are prices dropping and real estate uh, asset prices dipping and there being a so called uh, uh, deflation issue, none of that is causing a collapse in China's economy. So, why does it matter if you trust those numbers or not? And what about the fact that it, whether you call this whataboutism or, or whatever, how about the fact that if you want to ask the question how things are being financed, if you look at Russia and how they staved off sanctions, why can't the same be true about China? China has been leveled with sanctions around its most valuable industrial sectors, especially in technology by the United States, and they've attempted to garner Europe into this as well. Why can't it be that the Chinese government has stepped in and assisted in this process of ensuring that any of these issues that have come about, regardless of the reason, whether it's because of U.S. aggression, aggressive economic war, or whether it's just the world economy being unstable, why can't it be that the Chinese government has stepped in? They have, and that is the point. That is why there is an instability in China. That is why they don't even mention in these growth numbers. How could it be that prices are falling in these key areas like housing and food, et cetera, that there is uh, retail prices, that suddenly China's economy is still growing? Well, 
Look at the growth numbers for China where they are the highest. It's in high technology and innovative sectors. This is where China has placed its investment priorities. This is where the government is placing a lot of its focus. But they're not going to mention that. They're not going to mention how China has attempted to balance and curb problems related to its economy. But China will tell you. And here's what China had to say about the Wall Street Journal's propaganda. How its collapse theory is going to collapse yet again. This is an editorial in the Global Times, and it's important to understand this perspective because this is where the war, this is what it's all about. When Green Beret forces are stationed off the coast of China, it's because the United States is on this path of attempting to contain and curb China's economic influence and all of the consequences that it portends for the empire. So why shouldn't people trust the Wall Street Journal's reports on the economy? Because if they do, they're going to fall into a cognitive trap that leads to wrong judgment, missing out on the opportunity to benefit from China's growth dividends. It's no secret Western media outlets have lost the ability to objectively assess China's economic performance. It's a typical case for the Wall Street Journal to use sensational headlines to vacillate between China collapse theory and the China threat theory. The Wall Street Journal published more than 160 articles bad-mouthing the Chinese economy including the one I mentioned, but also the world is in for another China shock. China's 40-year boom is over. What comes next? How China made a youth unemployment crisis disappear? Is China's economic predicament as bad as Japan's? It could be worse, and China's economy is stuck in a vicious cycle. But is the Chinese economy really as trouble as the Wall Street Journal claims? Those who look deeper into the reports will find these arguments are clearly short-sighted and only focus on negative factors, turning a blind eye to the fact that China's economic growth rate still exceeds many other major economies, while pushing forward its economic transition toward high-quality development. So according to World Bank estimates of the growth rates of major economies in 2023, China's economic growth was about 1.5 times of the U.S. and 16.5 times of that of the Eurozone. When examining its China report over the long term, it is hard not to find a newspaper coverage of different periods of Chinese uh, economy that revolves around themes like criticizing China's economy over everything. For example, last month, it published a headline in China, deflation tightens its grip, while almost at the same time last year it claimed China's economic rebound would push inflation higher and ripple through global markets. Yeah, which one is it? The perception these Wall Street Journal reports leave is that the Chinese economy is on the brink of collapsing or it is rising so fast it poses a threat to the world. Both serve the same goal of smearing China's economic performance and weighing on investor confidence. Um, since Western countries believe that Chinese economic development has moved its cheese, the publication's stance makes it po- impossible to write an objective picture of the economy in China. That's why the Wall Street Journal doesn't mention that decoupling push has created widespread losses for China and the world, and that the Chinese economy is at a critical period of recovery and industrial upgrading, which has the potential to generate more growth momentum for the world. It only focuses on short term fluctuations in the Chinese economy, deliberately amplifying risks and challenges in an attempt to justify de-risking or decoupling policy toward China. It's based on the view that, uh, uh, but this biased view cannot hide the bright spots in China's economy, which is still in recovery and on track with an overall improvement in major macro indicators, massive consumption, a complete industrial system, and huge potential for technological innovation. Uh, Its electricity consumption was 2.3 times that of the U.S. and its vehicle sales were nearly twice that of the U.S. Its crude steel output was 12.6 out of the U.S. times of that of the U.S. And its shipbuilding completion volume was 70 times of the U.S. Uh, <laughs> so basically what they're saying is that China's industrial output is much more impressive. And not even that article mentioned that there was a 10 to 12 percent growth in these high tech innovative sectors in China over the last year in 2023. So all that is to say is that uh, the Wall Street Journal, the Mr. Mainstream Media, They are looking to amplify these so-called problems in China, which are minor problems, uh, so to speak, in order to justify economic war and in order to, as Global Times mentioned, and this is very true, cool the global investment climate on China so that Western corporations, Western investors are less likely to remain in China. And that has happened. There has been, for example, you'll see numbers about total trade volume with, for example, Mexico being higher now uh, between the United States and Mexico than with China, than U.S. and China. And so there have been consequences, and this has led China to need to readjust 
This is why it is moving forward with a Made in China 2025 agenda. This is why China is rapidly self becoming self-reliant in the high-tech sector and other areas of the economy so that it can be resilient in the face of these challenges. But nonetheless, the point is, is that whether it's economic war, whether it's the military side, there is one agenda here and it's war. And it's not letting up. The propaganda is not going to let up. The elections are coming in November here in the United States. China will be a major part of that, uh, uh, not least because certainly the Joe Biden administration is going to have to, as it did in its State of the Union address, move its eyes away from that quagmire and absolute mess that has pummeled its approval rating, which was already low when it comes to Gaza and has to turn its eyes away from that, as well as the fact that Ukraine is a done conflict. It's a finished conflict. There is nothing left for that but defeat. So China will likely emerge again as a major question. It's a major way that the U.S. political establishment flexes its so-called foreign policy muscle. And so it's important in these times to not turn our eyes away because the war is coming and it's closer than you think. And it's not to fear monger about a war, but it is to promise that if the trajectory remains the same, if the foreign policy blob, the establishment continues on this path, that the war is just inevitable. It's not about fear. It's not being afraid of it, although we should be afraid of the consequences. It's about understanding that it is coming. China is ready for this kind of war. China does have nuclear weapons. China has a very strong military. China has a population that will defend its country without hesitation. But the damage to the global economy, to humanity, will be unthinkable. It is unthinkable. And so that is why it's important to, in, at this stage, as that war builds up, to develop opposition, build opposition, and make sure that our eyes are not peeled away from this just because the United States is so good at committing mass murder and escalating global confrontation in other parts of the world. This is all connected. There is nothing about what's happening to China and against China that is disconnected from what's happening in Gaza, from what's happening in Ukraine, from NATO's drive to World War III with Russia, from the U.S. and Israel's attempt to maintain dominance in the Middle East. It's all connected. It's all to destabilize the planet so that this multipolar world led by China, led by Russia, cannot develop. And we have to ensure that that is prevented, that that is not uh, the trajectory that humanity faces and that humanity has to endure uh, for the foreseeable future. We need to build a different future. And that future is on the multipolar train. So let's hop on it ASAP. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.